so let's start. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so this is the launch of, uh, of this book, uh, Philosophy of Psychology and Introduction, by me, Kengo Miyazono, and Lisa Botrotti, who is uh, with, with us uh, here. So, uh, so this book, so if I understand it correctly, uh, this book is already available in UK already in May, uh, but um, other parts of the world, uh, it will be available in July, roughly in, in two weeks, um, so in the middle of July. So uh, today we are going to uh, uh, discuss uh, some chapters of, of this uh, of this book with uh, with wonderful commentators, um, but um, let me say a little bit uh, about uh, about this book. What kind of book this is? And uh, so uh, this is a textbook of uh, philosophy of psychology, and uh, this is uh, slightly different from previous textbooks uh, of uh, philosophy of psychology. Uh, among among the differences, uh, our focus is um, um, so we deal with a particular topic uh, throughout this book, and the topic is the limitation of human mind and cognition. So uh, we discuss human uh, limitations with regard to rationality, the limitations with regard to self-knowledge, uh, limitations with regard to free will and responsibility. We discuss the ways in which human mind uh, is biased, uh, influenced by emotions, situational factors, and implicit biases. So throughout the book, uh, we talk about uh, the, 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 the limitations of human mind and cognition. So um, maybe we can start by introducing ourselves. Uh, maybe I, I start. Uh, so I, so my, again, like uh, my, my name is Kengo Miyazono. I'm an associate professor uh, of philosophy at Hokkaido University uh, in Japan. Uh, I have been working on beliefs and delusions. Um, currently, I am looking for the next topic because, you know, writing this book uh, took me something like three years or four years. And then after completing this, I'm, I'm looking for the next thing to, to work on. Uh, but anyway, in general, philosophy of psychology is my area. I'm interested in rationality, irrationality, beliefs, uh, cognition, and judgment, uh, reasoning. So that's th these are my topics. Uh, maybe Lisa, you can introduce now yourself. Yes, thank you everybody for being with us today. Uh, very excited about uh, the book launch of uh, Philosophy of Psychology. I'm Lisa Bortolotti. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Birmingham. And I'm very lucky because I'm associated both with the philosophy department and the Institute for Mental Health in the School of Psychology. Um, philosophy of psychology is also my area, my main area, philosophy of cognitive science. Um, in uh, recent years, I've been focusing on uh, psychiatric conditions as well. So I've been looking at uh, symptoms of mental disorders, such as delusion and confabulation, but I'm also interested in uh, um, limitations of human cognition and agency that are not pathological and are considered to be pathological, um, like uh, optimism bias, for instance, and forms of confabulation that happen in the uh, non-clinical population. Nevia, maybe. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm Nevia Dolcini, and I am associate professor at the University of Macau um, in China. That's why I even gained a Chinese name. So my, my Chinese name is Du Shuiya, if I spell it correctly. Um, and I'm also a primary faculty uh, at the Center of Cognition and Brain Sciences at the University of Macau. This allows me to 
develop more interdisciplinary studies <clears throat> with my colleagues at the University of Macau. My interest, is, my interest in research lie in between uh, philosophy of language and philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology. Currently, I've been exploring um, the topic of mental imagery and imagination, which is a very specific aspect, very relevant for my uh, original project of developing a cognitive based semantics for natural languages. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I find this um, new textbook uh, in philosophy of psychology very exciting and very relevant for at least my, uh, my areas of interest and looking forward to discuss it. Thank you, Jules. Hi, thanks for having me today. Um, so I'm um, Jules Holroyd, a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Um, so I work on philosophy of psychology, um, but I'm also very interested in social philosophy and the intersection of those two fields. So the way that our agency is shaped by oppressive social contexts and the way that it is implicated in oppressive social contexts. Um, so I've been lucky to work with colleagues in psychology at Sheffield um, investigating um, implicit bias and the way that um, moral feedback um, impacts on implicit bias. Um, and the current project that I'm that I'm looking at is to do with our um, oppressive moral practices and thinking about how praise might be shaped by oppressive forces and how that might in turn kind of shape our agency. And um, so I'm really excited to be talking about these topics with you all today. Um, I really enjoyed reading the book and I'm looking forward to discussing it more as well today. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, we can start uh, with Nabia's presentation. Um, it will be something like 10 minutes, uh, roughly uh, followed by five to 10 minutes discussion. And then we can move on to Jules and uh, followed by discussion again. So uh, Nabia, uh, you, can, you can start your presentation now. Thank you. So uh, in my brief contribution today, I would like to touch upon a couple of points. The first one is going to be a metaphilosophical point, uh, while the second is a more theoretical aspect of your book, um, actually will be uh, about the entire project of your of your book, uh, but more specifically, I'm, I'm here focusing on uh, your first two chapters. So on the topic of rational, human rationality and uh, self-knowledge. So let's start with the metaphysical point, a metaphilosophical, sorry, metaphilosophical point. Uh, so this is a textbook, right? And textbooks we all know are very useful resources for students as well as for instructors especially when it comes to you know, the phase of course design. But there is one aspect of textbooks that often go unnoticed and I think um, is actually in fact very, very relevant, especially for um, disciplinary fields that are like recently, um, uh, recently becoming like uh, more dominant in the scene and highly interdisciplinary like in the case of philosophy of psychology. That is, when writing a textbook, introducing students to a disciplinary field, one need to address topics such as what is the scope of that disciplinary field? What is the goal, the aim, and what is the methodology? These, these topics, this area, these, these uh, aspects actually define the very identity of a disciplinary field. Uh, so I think that textbooks contribute to broadcast disciplinary identities. They help like setting the boundaries uh, with say neighboring fields and perhaps even contribute future shaping of the discipline itself. So this textbook, I find it um, 
very special because it is a common take that philosophy, like looking at the introductions, uh, the introductions of philosophy of psychology on the market, it, it is a common sharing that philosophy of psychology um, concerns with the two levels of investigation. One is like purely philosophical concerns with the typical problems uh, in philosophy. And at another level, it engages with non-philosophical studies, right? Although philosophically relevant, of course. So typical problems in philosophy, such as problems of cognition, problems of uh, modularity of the mind, a mental representation, mental imagery, uh, are sometimes even overlapping with the problems that are investigated in other areas of philosophy, such as, for example, philosophy of mind. And then uh, philosophy psychology is also expected to monitor very closely contemporary works in uh, fields that are non-philosophical, uh, spanning from neuroscience to artificial intelligence, psychiatry, um, experimental psychology or cognitive psychology, so far and so forth. Now, it is actually the case, looking at all the textbooks available up to now uh, in the market, that there is a, like a shared perception that these introductions have been weighted too heavily on the side of philosophy. And they typically tend to prioritize uh, foundational issues. This is actually what you have highlighted in, in, your, in your textbook at the very introductory uh, session of your textbook. And in the introduction, you promise to do something novel with your textbook. That is, you promise to overcome this that is has been perceived as a limitation of textbooks on this discipline on the market. By um, by having more, by waiting more on the implicational side, right, on the psychological studies and taking into account more heavily psychological studies and see their implications. I think that your promise has been like for fulfilled, like completely fulfilled. And I think this is one of the major strengths of, of, your, of your textbook. Uh, you actually succeed in selecting and presenting um, discussions where work in philosophy and work in psychology mesh very, very nicely. So students in psychology can learn a big deal about good contemporary studies in philosophy. And at the same time, students in philosophy can learn a lot about contemporary works like in neuroscience and, and experimental sciences. Now, there's a two levels of investigation that ideally shall um, identify philosophy of psychology as an autonomous discipline has been reflected in the very structure of your book on, in each chapter of it. So for example, if you look at the chapter on rationality or the chapter on uh, self-knowledge, you start by setting two sets of questions. The first set is the set of the philosophical questions, basically representing, if you want, a foundational uh, way of doing philosophy psychology. And the second set of questions is that includes psychological questions. So let's take the example of, uh, of, the, of uh, self, the problems in self-knowledge. Uh, the set of philosophical questions are about the nature of self-knowledge and about the conditions, sufficient and necessary conditions for self-knowledge. Uh, whereas the psychological set of questions are about uh, whether or not subjects like human subjects satisfy the conditions for, for self-knowledge. So I think that this balanced interaction between uh, philosophical and psychological questions uh, is taken to be the like regulative ideal, right? At least ought to be the regulative ideal. However, my, my metaphilosophical concern is that like in the end, in the end, uh, 
these two sets of questions need to be hierarchically related to each other. So it seems to me that a philosophical question, say um, investigating about the conditions, necessary and sufficient conditions for say self-knowledge is actually a prerequisite for the very possibility of asking the psychological question that is whether or not subjects uh, satisfy such conditions. So this is my, my first point. I'm very curious to hear uh, your view, your metaphilosophical uh, view on this point, whether there should, there ought to be um, a hierarchical relationship between these two levels of, of investigation or, or not. So the second point, the this, this theoretical point is very generally on your view, on your, on your uh, position with respect to this large debate on human cognition that you present very clearly in the textbook. Um, in each chapter. And I will more specifically focus, as I said before, on, uh, on the issue of rationality, whether humans are rational reasoners and self-knowledge, whether humans are actually capable of uh, knowing themselves. But I think that the point that I will raise is actually um, relevant for the, the entire textbook because it's representative of your uh, whole view on, on human cognition. So um, this is also because in your textbook, and this is um, not nece necessary, but I think is, is, a, is a, another strength of, of your textbook, you not just have a didactic goals or perhaps metaphilosophical goals, but also uh, theoretical goals, right? So you manage to also present your position within this larger debate on human rationality. So uh, when it comes to human rationality, when it comes to the capacity, the question of whether humans are capable of reasoning uh, rationally and capable of gaining that non-observational knowledge on uh, on, the self, on themselves, uh, in the book you reject to extreme positions that roughly can be summarized as the, pos the optimistic position, claiming that uh, humans are like perfect or near perfect rational reasoners, and humans are uh, are capable of, of complete or near to complete non-observational self-knowledge, uh, and you also reject pessimism, claiming that. Um, humans are hopeless in both rational reasoning and the capacity for self-knowledge. So you, you, you propose a middle, what I take to be a middle way in between optimism and pessimism that you call realism, uh, according to which human cognition, yes, is imperfect, and the capacity of humans for self-knowledge is um, not flawless. And actually, uh, in some cases, humans are not capable of gaining that non-observational uh, access uh, into their mind. But still, humans, uh, human cognition is good enough. OK, so it's good enough. Not only is good enough, but if we, we can learn, we can learn how to overcome uh, the obstacles, you know, for, for being like good self-knowers and good rational reasoners. And the more we learn about human cognition, and the more we can get closer and closer in a way to be near to perfect, if not perfect, uh, uh, rational reasoners. And near to complete um, self-knowers. So my, uh, my question for you is, yes, I do understand uh, all the reasons why uh, this, um, this position uh, is to be distinguished from, from optimistic positions. For sure, it's incompatible with uh, a pessimistic positions on human con cognition. But still, I wonder whether uh, irrealism is a kind of optimism in disguise, uh, because it also entails the possibility, at least, to become, you know, better 
a reasoners and betters and knowers. And uh, I would like to know whether you see any obstacle for this process of improvement to be stopped at some point. And if so, if these are for metaphysical reasons. Thank you, Nevia. That was wonderful. Um, so I will start uh, with some thoughts, um, but then I will let Kengo come in as well, because uh, of course he might have different views. <laughs> so uh, the, the fun of writing this book together has been also kind of negotiating uh, subtle differences in our perceptions. Um, so I don't want to answer for him as well. Um, you have uh, given a very charitable and generous uh, presentation introduction of the book and you have also captured perfectly the spirit <laughs> of the book for us so that the spirit of the book was to emphasize something that uh, is not prominent in in current discussions of philosophy of psychology and even not that prominent in the way in which the subject is taught in many places um, and and focus on the actual interaction between the conceptual questions and the empirical questions, um, rather than uh, just uh, get the philosophy to bear on the work of the psychologist um, in, in a way that presupposes that the philosophers have already worked out the concepts perfectly well, and all we need to do is to see whether those concepts uh, map onto reality. Uh, the your question is whether there is a hierarchy. Uh, so if the conceptual questions are prior to uh, the, the empirical questions, and in many ways, you know, you could see that they are, you know, as, as you were saying, if, if you don't know what it means to be rational, how can you go onto the field and investigate whether people are rational? But I think the way I see it is that it's a little bit of a cycle uh, so you start with the empirical, sorry, with, you start with the conceptual question, which might come from a general understanding of what rationality should entail. And in the case of rationality and self-knowledge, which are value laden, like we, we like rationality and self-knowledge, that's what we want, that's what we aspire to. Um, you know, it, they, they are very kind of complex uh, kind of concepts where, you know, in some situations they, are just equivalent to stamps of approval, right? When you're talking about someone or a set of behaviors as rational, you're just saying, yeah, that, that is the way you should do things, right? So certainly the philosopher needs to unpack what it means. Yes, that's the way to do things. You know, Why is it that that's the way to do things? What kind of standards, normative standards are we um, trying to conform to and are they the right normative standards for the kind of thing that we are looking at which is human uh, cognition and agency so that that's a really big project in itself but then the idea is that when you go to the field and <laughs> apply the concept and you discover as it has been discovered in the studies in the 70s and 80s and 90s that whatever humans do is very, very different <laughs> from what we would expect them to do if they were rational uh, thinker and rational agents. Then you wonder, do we have the right concept? I mean, should we keep this concept of human rationality as it is, right? Given that it doesn't really match on what we're doing. Maybe it is a good concept of rationality for angels or you know, for artificial intelligence or for superhumans. But what if it's not the concept of rationality that we need? Um, then I see it as a big, big kind of uh, circle where things come back. So when, when the empirical evidence comes in and tells you, look, you're pretty rubbish at syllogisms, but you're really good at guessing where danger may be in the jungle, right? So maybe that's the kind of rationality that we want. Now, you don't want to kind of just follow the evidence, so we are also skeptical about notions of ecological rationality that have been developed just to justify um, what humans do. But I think you want a good interaction there, a good dialogue. You want a bit of going in and, 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 and discussing things and, and readjusting things, which leads, I think, to the, to the question about whether we are really realists or whether we are optimists in disguise. So let, again, I answer for myself, but I think 
there is one type of optimism that I'm sure both Kengo and I don't like, and it's the apology, right? So when I was a graduate student and there was this big fuss about human rationality and Nobel Prize winner Kahneman was saying, people don't know what they want, just tell them what they need to do. There was this very strong philosophical reaction is like, don't touch human rationality. If we have developed the concept of human rationality, it means that we can also be rational just as the concept says we can be. So there was a complete denial in some uh, parts of the philosophical community, by all means, not everybody, denial of the results as evidence against human rationality. So that, that's what I kind of call the, the kind of the apologetic move, right? Yeah, it's, it's not us. It's, it's, it cannot be true. The methodology must be wrong. And so that's what we want to reject. So that's the kind of optimism that we don't like. The blind optimism, the optimism that is a form of denial. So the optimism I like is the optimism that says, yes, there are problems, that there are very big problems, but the more we know about those problems, the more we can think of solutions. So it's optimistic uh, in the long run, <laughs> because um, the idea is that we are not stuck with what we have, we can get better, but it's not optimistic in the sense that it denies that there are issues. Um, so that's more or less, I guess, my answer. It's not fully satisfactory because you want to know more about how likely it is that we can improve. Let me just say one last thing. I don't think the aim is perfect rationality. Uh, I don't think the aim is perfect self-knowledge. The aim in, in the kind of moderate optimist, optimist that I am would be, you know, let's do a little bit better. Let's get a little bit closer to what we would like. It may be that there isn't very much room for maneuver just because of our limitations as, as human beings, fine. But you know, whatever we can control, let's try to control it. You know, and the kind of knowledge is power kind of thing. But I let Kengo come in on this as well. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I don't think I have uh, anything to add on the meta philosophical point because I have exactly the same idea of the cyclical uh, process, mutual process between uh, empirical work and a philosophical work where we need to go back and forth between them, uh, uh, conceptual work and then, and then experimental work. So I'm not gonna add anything uh, to it. And uh, about the second point, um, I, I really like your comment, Navia, because that's exactly what I, was thinking about when I was writing, when we were writing the introduction and a conclusion part. And then also this is related to the implicit biases, uh, uh, the issues of implicit biases, which we will discuss uh, with Jules uh, in, a, in a moment. So the idea is that human cognition, self-knowledge, rationality uh, shouldn't be conceived as static, like a stable and the same. Maybe those kind of things are dynamic in the sense that, you know, that our rationality can be improved, the self-knowledge can be expanded, and our responsibility can also be expanded. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, we can, we can do psychology, and the psychology tells you uh, that uh, you uh, have some limitations in rationality, and then we just figure we can figure out how to improve it. Uh, you know, we can we can you know we can find the context in which uh, our we we tend to make mistakes. We can we and we can be prepared uh, for the kind of errors we tend to make. And then in the context of the implicit biases. Um, so we, you know, uh, there's a there's a big difference between the time in which nobody knew about implicit biases, like a, like maybe twenty or maybe like thirty years ago, and now we know uh, a lot uh, about the the biases we have or we might might have, and I think that changes. Uh, things a lot because we we now know we we have the scientific uh, 
form of self-knowledge about the kind of creatures we are, and then that changes the responsibility uh, we have about the our our behavior and then and the social structure as well. So uh, I, I really like that point. So it's uh, so in a way it's optimistic, right? So it's a uh, in a way our you know the the rationality is yeah. So it's. So the, the, my, my point is that I want to, so I'm, I'm yeah, I have this kind of view that, um, yes, we, we, talk, we talked about limitations, but, um, you know, the, the limitations are not, you know, stable. We, we can make a difference. Um, yeah. Thanks. Can I jump in um, and, and yeah, sure. add, add a comment about the, the sort of hierarchy of the questions? Um, I guess one, one thing that, that has struck me in working in, in um, philosophy of psychology is the way that sometimes like there's just different goals so that philosophers want to kind of analyze a, a concept of, of belief and come to a sort of uh, a, a analysis that tells us about our concept but then then psychologists sometimes just need a concept that they can operationalize so i so so when when kengo you were talking just now about the um the sort of way the concepts are dynamic it seems it seems to me i think that one way in which they're dynamic is just that sometimes we need different concepts for different purposes so that the psychologists just want something they can use in a in a in a um, study which might depart from the, the sense that the, the the philosophers are using and I think one thing I really liked about the, the book was the way in which you were sort of presenting their psychological studies um, and their engagement with the philosophical problems which was really showing how they speak to each other despite the fact that there might sometimes be these sort of slightly different concepts at, at work in the background and that you were kind of bringing their their studies that spoke to the relevant philosophical questions into context. But that I think is, is one of the sort of reason to reject the hierarchy of, um, of questions. Cause I think sometimes there's, there's just different goals in play. And so you need sort of different concepts for those different goals. I don't know, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point actually. Um, especially the point about uh, sometimes the need that empirical psychologists have for uh, operationalization of the really con, con complex uh, context. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we think about beautiful um, uh, definitions of delusions, but then they have to check whether a certain sample of the population is a delusion in it, and they have to do it with a questionnaire that takes a certain amount of time. So uh, yeah, definitely those are challenges um, that the philosophers sometimes do not, uh, do not uh, have to contend with. So, so that's a really good point. Um, Jules, do you want to start presenting um, your, your bit then? That would be a good time. Sure. So I'm going to try and do the, the present thing on Zoom. I have some slides and let's hope it, hope it works. Um, here we go. So I think if I go to present mode, um, is that working? Great. <laughs> okay, so it's interesting what you we were just discussing about this kind of metaphilosophical question because in fact I was going to start by saying one of the things I really like about the whole framing of this textbook is the way that that you suggest that one of the um, uses of um, implicational philosophy of psychology is to to use it to sort of learn about the threats to or limits of our agency, but in particular to to think about it as a means to help us improve it, um, and that that. Um, psychology and the studies in psychology and then and then engaging with those in a philosophical way can provide us with a source of resources to understand how we can be better agents and I really really liked that framing the sort of constructive engagement of philosophy and psychology I thought that was great so um, in my um, comments then I'm going to talk about the chapter on free will and responsibility um, so I'll provide a kind of brief summary of some of, not all, because there were many arguments, but some of the key arguments in that um, chapter, and then I want to raise a, a sort of um, challenge to where um, Lisa and Kengo end up in that chapter and, and see what you think of that challenge. So the, the main um, challenge that is focused on in that chapter is the challenge from epiphenomenalism. So um, the, 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 the idea is that, well, if, if we're free agents, we think that our conscious states are causally relevant in producing our actions. Um, but the challenge from epiphenomenalism says that that, that sense of um, our 
the, the role of our um, conscious states might be wrong. Um, they might be merely epiphenomenal, so not doing any causally significant work. Um, so Kengo and Lisa set up really nicely, um, I think not just in this chapter, but in all of them, the arguments are presented in really crisp, clear argumentative form, which will make it really helpful for students to um, engage with. Um, so here's a, a reconstruction of one of the challenges or the general challenge from epiphenomenalism to free will um, reconstructed. So if we're free, our conscious states are causally significant in producing our actions. The studies in psychology seem to show um, that conscious states are not causally significant in producing our actions. And so one of the implications of those studies might be um, that we're not free agents. So um, Lisa and Kengo take up um, this um, argument, this sort of broad argument about the challenge from epiphenomenalism and want to show that in fact we, sh we shouldn't um, think that the implication of of these studies is that we're lacking in free agency or that responsibility is impossible. So the way they proceed is by presenting us with, um, with the studies. One of those, for example, are the studies from situationism. So Dali and Batson's study that looks at how um, um, priests in training um, engaged in altruistic behavior. And it, it looks like in that study um, that Whereas you might have thought that priests would be guided by their character, their values, their commitments, and help when they had the opportunity to help to do so on the basis of those values and commitments. In fact, it looks like um, what was more important in, in um, influencing their behavior was um, the situational features. When they were told they were in a rush, hurry up, they, they didn't help when they had the opportunity to do so. So that might be the kind of study that leads us to think, well, um, we're not free agents. Um, the situational factors have a greater role in producing our behavior than our conscious states. The conscious states are merely epiphenomenal. Um, but Kengo and Lisa um, suggest that no, in fact, um, if we think really carefully about what, what these studies show, we shouldn't conclude that we're never free. Um, so the Situationist studies, for example, don't show us that we never have um, free agency. They don't show that our conscious states are causally irrelevant. They just show that sometimes other things are also <laughs> causally relevant. Um, but that doesn't mean that our conscious states don't have any role. And nor, crucially, does it show that um, we never have free agency. So even if we thought that um, there was something problematic with the agency of the would-be priests and that they're influenced by being told to hurry up, that condition doesn't generalize to all our other actions. Um, so um, Kengo and Lisa per persuasively show us that this generalization condition just, it, it, this, gen um, this threat doesn't generalize. Um, they put it in terms of meeting a generalization condition. So, um, so the interesting questions then are not whether we're ever free, but rather whether there are particular circumstances that threaten our agency and when and to what extent we are free or responsible agents. So the, the sort of more modest challenge is to identify what those situations are. And these kinds of worries arise also in the context of implicit bias. So here, um, again, there's a there's an epiphenomenal worry. Um, oh, I've missed a slide, so I'm just going to go <laughs> implicit bias. So, uh, so um, yeah, just to, to sort of uh, present the kind of thing that is being spoken about with respect to implicit biases. So Lisa and Kengo, um, you present implicit biases in this context as states that are introspectively inaccessible, so we can't easily um, just look inside ourselves and discover that we have um, implicit biases. And um, they're descriptively and normatively biased. So they're states that we shouldn't have, um, but also by the agent's own lights, they're states that, that she typically wouldn't want. And the animating example that Kengo and Lisa give us here is of Elsa, somebody who believes she has egalitarian beliefs. She's not aware that she has implicit biases, um, but in fact, um, she does have implicit biases, implicit racial biases, and discriminates against people of color. Um, so sitting further away from them on a bus or um, being um, dismissive of one of her colleagues. So I might think, well, if it's implicit biases that are driving our behavior rather than her conscious 
beliefs, so conscious egalitarian beliefs, one might think, well, this is another case where those conscious states are merely epiphenomenal, and in fact, um, because it's implicit biases driving our behavior, um, individuals who are um, who act on the basis of those implicit biases are not morally responsible. But Kengo and Lisa then um, tease apart the different bases on which one might make those judgments. Um, so one might think that um, agents are not responsible for implicit biases because of a lack of awareness of some kind or because of a lack of control. And I'm gonna focus just here on the um, arguments for awareness, um, but the, the strategies that they deploy um, are parallel with respect to control. So Kengo and Lisa, you suggest um, that, well, we can, we can tease apart the different senses of awareness that might be at stake. And when we carefully reconstruct um, the philosophical arguments, we can see that, again, that conclusion that we're, we're never responsible for implicit biases is false. So we might focus first on um, direct awareness. And again, here's the kind of really clear, crisp reconstruction of arguments that I think makes the, the, the um, discussion so accessible. Um, so Kengo and, and, and Lisa reconstruct an argument about direct awareness. Um, it looks like this, the studies from psychology show that we lack direct awareness of implicit biases. We can't just introspect and be aware that we might have, for example, implicit racial biases. And then the philosophical premise comes, well, lack of direct awareness is incompatible with moral responsibility for implicit biases. Therefore, we're not morally responsible for implicit biases. But Kengo and Lisa argue this argument um, has a false premise, premise two, the philosophical premise, um, because in fact, it's clear from the um, psychology that individuals can have awareness of implicit biases via indirect um, means. They, they provide us with studies which allow us to learn about implicit biases, as Kengo just remarked. Like we used, used to not have awareness of the phenomena of implicit biases and precisely um, in part because of the psychological studies about implicit biases, we now do have that awareness. And that kind of awareness um, could be sufficient for moral responsibility. So maybe Elsa um, in the example has taken some indirect measures and learned that she has implicit biases, or maybe she's just aware of the literature about um, implicit biases and that it's likely that she has implicit biases. That kind of awareness could be sufficient for moral responsibility. And then if we turn to um, an argument that takes in this broader sense of awareness, Lisa and Kengo reconstruct that as follows, um, that maybe um, we lack direct and indirect awareness of implicit biases. And that kind of awareness is incompatible with moral responsibility for implicit biases. And that would again lead us to the conclusion that we're not morally responsible. But here too, they argue the, the um, argument has a false premise, but in this case, it's the psychological premise. So whilst it might be true that we would need some kind of awareness for moral responsibility, we might need to be indirectly or directly aware, um, it's not true that we lack all those kinds of um, awareness. As we've just seen, um, the studies in psychology show that we can gain indirect awareness of our implicit biases. So this, um, this um, argumentative strategy is, is deployed to show, well, once you construct this argument form and we see that there's a psychological premise and a, and a philosophical premise, the, the key challenge is to have an argument that has both true psychological premises and true philosophical premises, and it doesn't look like it's possible to establish um, one of those kinds of arguments. Um, it, it, it looks like either the psychological or the um, philosophical premises are false, and so we can't establish that conclusion that we're not morally responsible for implicit biases. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to those um, arguments and those conclusions. But I wondered whether there might be a, a sort of more um, indirect worry about free will and moral responsibility that arises out of these studies. So I agree that the arguments um, that we've seen don't establish that agents have no free agency and they don't establish that we lack moral responsibility. But I wonder if there's a, a sort of indirect epistemic challenge to free will and moral responsibility that arises out of the, the sort of totality of, um, of the psychological studies. Um, so thinking about implicit biases, um, I, I'm very um, inclined to agree with the conclusion from, from Kengo and Lisa that um, 
we, we may not lack moral responsibility for implicit biases. We may indeed sometimes be morally responsible for them. But um, as, as we've just seen, in some cases, that's gonna depend on the kind of awareness that an individual has, like whether or not they have awareness of um, their implicit biases as a result of some studies that they've taken or inferences they've made about their, their behavior. And it's crucially going to depend on um, whether if they lack that kind of awareness, whether they're culpable for that lack or whether it's because they haven't really had any, any, um, any fair opportunity to encounter um, the relevant information. And I wonder if, you know, in, in, in our um, lives, <laughs> when we're kind of encountering each other and making those in the moment judgments, one of the worries might be that we often don't have um, that knowledge about whether the agent, what kind, what kind of awareness the agent has or on what basis the agent lacks it. And so even if we think that these studies don't show us that um, we are not um, morally responsible, so even if we can con conclude that moral responsibility is possible, maybe these um, studies and, and sort of picking apart the kinds of awareness, for example, that might be in involved might um, undermine our confidence about engaging in the practices of moral responsibility. So they might lead us to think, oh yes, I, I, I agree that somebody could be responsible if they have a certain kind of awareness, but I'm just not sure that I ever know um, whether they have that kind of awareness, at, at least sometimes. Maybe sometimes with you know, close friends, we, we can know enough about them. But other times when we're making sort of judgments in the, in the world with, with, with people we don't know so well, maybe, maybe our confidence in our ability to hold people responsible is shaken. And I wonder if a similar worry might arise in relation to um, free agency and thinking about the situationist studies. So, oh, I'm trying to click through, um, here we go. <laughs> so um, again, we, I, I, I agree with your conclusion that the situationist study um, doesn't lead us to conclude that we, we never have free will. Um, but I wonder if it might lead us to lose confidence in the fact that our agency rather than our circumstances are the drivers of our action. So I might think, yes, um, we're not always in um, the kind of hurry conditions that the um, seminary students were in, the would-be priests who didn't help. And so um, that that kind of situational feature isn't always going to be there threatening our, our agency. But I don't know what other situational features might be. Maybe there are others that have um, those kind of effects. And indeed, the studies that, that you run through suggest there are there are lots of others that are quite surprising, you know, whether the glove is on the on the right, <laughs> um, whether we've just um, been primed by words to do with old age and, and so on. Those are all quite surprising. So I might, it might just shake my confidence in my understanding of, of when and to what extent we have um, free agency. So again, this, this is in a sense um, to agree with your um, sort of conclusion that, that the really interesting questions are about when and to what extent we're free. But I wonder if in order to sort of robustly shore up our practices of engaging with each other as free agents and, and holding each other more responsibility, we need to have clearer answers to those questions of, of when and to what extent we're free, otherwise our, our confidence in those practices might be undermined. So I'll, I'll stop there um, and stop sharing so that we can see each other again. Thanks. Thank you, Jules. Uh, so maybe I can, oh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful point. And then maybe I can, I can start saying uh, something in response and then maybe Lisa can join uh, later. Um, so I agree, I think I agree with the, basically everything you, you said, and then the, the, the problem you are raising uh, toward the end uh, 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 about that problem, I don't think I have a perfect answer to that problem. Um, so, so let me share with you some, some random thoughts uh, on, on that problem. So one is that I think lovely there are two kinds of limitations. Um, one is the limitation with regard to the, so we don't seem to have necessarily the sufficient condition. 
uh, uh, for responsibility yet. And then, so that's the one source of limitation. So we discussed uh, some candidates uh, of necessary condition, and we like some of them we reject. Uh, but uh, you know, after going through all of that, we haven't uh, arrived at any necessary and sufficient condition yet. And so I think that's one source of uh, limitation contributing to this situation where we don't have, a, you know, we, we 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 still have this kind of epistemic. Um, uh, problem. Uh, so I think that's one kind of problem. The other problem you, I think you mentioned a little bit is the limitation about empirical, empirical limitation. So the empirical limitation about the what factors are actually contributing to particular cases and the extent uh, to which those factors are contributing to the to the uh, to to the to the performance uh, at issue. So I think that so may, perhaps those two things are the main sources of of the problem. And then I don't think there's a there's a nice and a perfect solution of the to problems, maybe we need to tackle uh, like a, uh, the philosophical side and uh, philosophical limitation and the empirical limitation uh, independently from each other. Uh, and then, you know, so we need to make a bit more progress on the, on the, on, on the philosophical side. Uh, for example, we uh, suggest, you know, we, we talked uh, a little bit um, about the idea that, um, you know, there being, um, you know, the fact that you ought to be aware of implicit biases can be a ground for moral responsibility in some cases. And if we agree on that, so uh, then we can look at uh, the actual cases and then make some judgments about who uh, are the people uh, who ought to be aware of the biases. And then, yeah, so we, we, we can make some progress on, on that side. And then, and then we can work on uh, empirical um, side as well. And we need to know more about the, the ways in which the factors uh, bias human performances, the ways in which implicit biases actually influence um, people's everyday behavior. And then, uh, you know, the better understanding on those empirical issues uh, will improve our situation um, a little bit. Uh, although I don't think <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the final the complete solution of your of the epistemic uh, epistemic um, problem uh, will be very very far away from us. <laughs> uh, anyway, so th these are my my thoughts. Uh, yeah, Lisa, I do you want to? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add because I completely agree with with Jules and and with Kengo's reply. So I guess the main point was to say it's not enough to say that there is indirect awareness to also concluded that there is no moral responsibility, we need to know more. But then, you know, the question is, you can never point a finger and say, you <laughs> should have known, because you don't really know what people's situa people situation is. And even if Elsa, as an employer, has been through kind of, uh, uh, what's it called, equality and inclusiveness uh, training, you know, we had, we know because of the questions about rationality and self-knowledge that we were discussing with Nevia, that when people learn about these things, they normally think that they are about someone else, right? So other people are implicitly biased, but I'm not, surely I'm not, right? So even telling them that there is this risk, you know, can increase their awareness in some way, but doesn't actually tell us that they have internalized that as, as a personal challenge that they need to work 
around uh, work towards, especially when the training comes at an age where most of our beliefs and attitudes are consolidated. I think it may be different if, if, if it's available to young children, you know, if they start thinking about these situations in a different way from, from, uh, from an early age. But so I totally agree. I think that epistemic problem will stay and it wasn't something that at least I think we wanted to, um, to, to provide a solution to. Um, it's just, you know, kind of high, at this point, it's, it's a little bit, little bit dispiriting, but it's highlighting the complexity and, and surely we need lots more empirical evidence to identify more of the factors that may be um, influential in the way in which we make decisions. Thank you, Jules. Anyway, great, great commentary. Can I, can I can I just add? I think one one thing that yeah one other thing that I really like about the book is the way that these problems are all presented, you know, in in one book, and so you do see the connections between them in a way that is really illuminating, as you just pointed out, like the the problems of self knowledge and rationality are, are one of the reasons why there's such difficulties in relation to overcoming implicit bias, and I think that's a, really a strength of the book that it brings together all of all, all of the kinds of challenges, and you can help it helps to see the interrelations between them, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. Uh, so uh, then uh, do we want to have some final discussions or anything or? Any comments, Maria? Any, any some? I, uh, just, um, I, I do not, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think we have the time to add uh, at, at least to specific to specific uh, chapters or topics in the book, but I do agree with Jules that uh, what what is really special about the book, besides this um, novelty that uh, is brought about in the way in which philosophy psychology is presented, is also that the chapters uh, are autonomous, are, are autonomous, like they, they are very valuable autonomously, so they can even be used, you know, to, to develop uh, courses in different disciplines, not specifically just in the philosophy of psychology. Uh, and also, not just they are autonomous, that they are so very well interconnected with each other, so that we can, we can see, like Jules has already said, why the problem in one area is, 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 has an impact in the prob in a problem in another area and what are the relationships between these areas at different levels, both empirically and philosophically. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Nevi and Jules, for participating in our book launch. It has been fantastic to, to hear from you and to see you on this occasion. And uh, yeah. Uh, we learned a lot and I think uh, we will keep thinking about these issues as well. It's not easy <laughs> to, to kind of shelf. We just have to keep thinking about them. I would like to add some special thanks for you two for the textbook because uh, we really, I mean, I really needed something like this on the market and I'm going to adopt it for sure. I, I don't know uh, still if like um, the complete textbook or just some chapters, but it was very much needed. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Navia. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank Thanks you for Nikki. joining us. I to teach on these topics with this book. It's great. <laughs> Thanks thank so you. much. Bye bye. Bye bye.